what tips can you give my listeners to achieve a healthier microbiome? Because, you know, we do live in tumultuous times, stressful times. Our food environment has become largely ultra processed. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, despite what may or may not have occurred during the first thousand days Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of one of my listeners' lives, what can people listening, watching this start doing, integrating today to um, foster a healthier gut microbiome? Yeah, I think it starts by food first approach, right? So you have to eat a healthy fiber rich diet. I think that's key. You have to eat some kind of fermented products, uh, whether you're taking yogurts or kefir or, or kombucha, you know, these are kind of where you can get really the, the, um, the healthy gut bacteria. And then some sort of supplementation, you know, lot, there are companies uh, which are um, have clinically tested probiotics that help things like irritable bowel, uh, for example, or bloating. Uh, so you use clinically backed probiotic products. I would say that's probably there and eat fresh foods. You know, uh, mm. I think that if I, 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 I had to say that I have seen people make so much urolitin A and, and they, and when I look at their dietary records, they're all eating berries and nuts mm. by, by the bowls. And that's part of why I think they're lucky because not only do they have the gut microbiome, but they are making the effort to eat the right diet. Well, what you feed, you breed. Yeah, exactly. Essentially. Yeah. But you said that no matter how much pomegranate you consume, you're not a urolithin A producer. <laughs> yeah, I can drink six glasses and zilch. Zero. Wow. So, and that's where I think it's primarily because of all the antibiotics I took. Mm. In, in India, practitioners, medical doctors, would give antibiotics for common cold. Wow. So as a kid, if you have a lot of runny nose, you take a lot of antibiotics. And I think that damaged my microbiome to an extent where I can recover parts of it, but not the part that is needed to metabolize the health benefits of certain phytonutrients. Hmm. Have you looked into the research on fecal microbiota transplantation? Good question. I have, uh, in my past life, I was studying a lot of kids with allergies. Uh, that was my uh, training as an immunologist. Um, we were looking into that space, but yeah, I haven't done any clinical trials. Try clinical it. Clinical trials. Try it and report back. Yeah. Uh, there are companies that are now in the space that are doing, but they're again going, you know, if you have inflammatory bowel disease, you, you can be considered uh, for fecal transplantation or you have obesity, then, you know, there are trials underway where they're transplanting microbiome of people who are blessed thin, you know, Mm. for example. So I think that research is still in its naivety and in five, 10 years horizon, they may be a poop pill. (laughs) Yeah. It won't surprise me. It's super interesting. I started reading about FMT. Yeah, yeah. 15 years ago now, problem years there ago? is the um, how do i say the gmp and the and the the good manufacturing issues and making sure even the trials that i'm familiar with, with with the fmt problem is you need hundreds of patients you get a batch of fmt and you do the transplantation and you see an effect and then you add more patients then you make another batch and that batch may differ from the previous batch so i think that's where some of the fine tuning is needed in, in, in the business of, of FMT. Yeah, like standardizing. Yeah, lab grown. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's very interesting. But I mean, the, the animal research is, is so compelling that, you know, they'll take the microbiome, they'll take the, the they'll take fecal material from a lean mouse. I, I did that. I did that. So, you did? Yeah, I took the, the fecal material of a highly allergic kid and I put it in a mouse which had no previous exposure to any allergen and then mouse got allergy. Wow. Yeah. So there are, there are studies like this that you can do. You can give the microbiome of centenarians or very fit people, uh, Olympians, and you, and there's actually companies, I think from Harvard that is called, that is doing, taking the fecal material of these super endurance athletes and trying to transplant it into very fatigued individuals. So I think the the possibilities are endless. That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. So exciting what the future holds. 
what guidance do you have for listeners that um, might be interested in looking into probiotics, which I know can be kind of like the wild, wild west, but finding good clinical data and then um, tying that, you know, identifying the probiotic strain and then looking for that on the market? Well, I think that's where I say, what are you taking the probiotic for? If it's certain gastrointestinal problem you have, if you have irritable bowel syndrome, or if you have problems with constipation, then there are clinically tested probiotics. Uh, there's, I think, one called Align uh, that is very clinically tested. There's a company, um, I think Seed or something, that they have a very clinically tested blend of probiotics for IBS and people who have dysfunctional gut. Uh, but I think the research is a bit mixed when it comes to you're healthy, you have healthy gut, what can you do to make it more healthy? You see, there I don't have a particular, um, let's say, reference in mind to su suggest to you in individuals. But if you have gastrointestinal issues, then there's definitely research uh, and products that you can take. Yeah, I think if you're, if you're healthy, you probably don't need a probiotic. You probably uh, just focus on fermented foods. You can diet a sufficient, I would believe. There. Yeah, eating a broad array of fruits and vegetables and yeah. things like that. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So cool. So what's next for you guys are now, I guess, probably anxiously awaiting the results of these Cedar sinai trials? And So we are now in this, a uh, lot of trials were started initially done by us and, and people like independent validation, having independent investigators kind of show that similar effects. Uh, so what we are doing now is we are looking at different angles of longevity. What, what other pathways does this molecule do? And inflammation is, is a, it's a big one and I'm a trained immunologist. So we got interested there. So we are looking at people whose immune system and immune health is not the most perfect. Uh, we're also looking at cancer patients who have recovered from cancer uh, and they come out with almost no immune system and immune cells need mitochondria to, to be healthy and to function be, uh, as good as they can. And so that's one area of uh, research we are very excited about, some of the new data which is unpublished that we just got working with uh, the Buck Institute in, in Novato, uh, California, suggests that taking urolitinase for longer uh, time, so about a month, uh, rewires a sort of youthful immune system. Mm. Uh, so it takes an aged immune system and makes it more energetic. And now that immune system can see bacteria and viruses better and fight uh, better. So that's the research we are doing. And then the, the brain is really, for me, the, 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 big, the big one in, in this trial I told you about uh, in people who have these sleep issues is, is up and coming. And then the work of NIH is, you know, on metabolic health and cancer health is, is very exciting. Do, do we still think that like turmeric and curcumin is uh, all that it's been sort of made out to be? Curcumin is a fascinating molecule as well. I think it's limited by its bioavailability, much like most natural compounds are. And so a lot of research in that space is now at how we can enhance its bioavailability. Um, quercetin is a great molecule as well. Uh, similar origins, similar fruit, you know, uh, quercetin is now also talked about as a senolytic, hmm. meaning it can, you know, in our bodies, in addition to, um, let's say the problems with accumulation of the waste, what happens is a lot of these cells become slow and they, we call them senescent cells. So they kind of suck up a lot of energy and nutrition, but they don't really do anything. And, and so in the field of longevity, there's also this interest in senolytics and, uh, and you're, we don't know if urotene is a senolytic, but it may as well be, uh, but quercetin is well proven in that space to, to kind of take these zombie cells out. Super prevalent antioxidant in mm -hmm. vegetables for, yeah. for fruit. Yeah, broccoli, there's interest in sulfoprane as well, which is found in broccoli. It's another natural compound. A lot of catechins, uh, every catechin from green tea, etc. cetera. Uh, there's, so I, I personally find the whole natural product space fascinating. I think there is so much to research on uh, there and, and to see how they get metabolized into um, different you know, sub metabolites in the body and that haven't been yet discovered. So that, that is an amazing field. 
Yeah, I'm often asked my thoughts on the carnivore diet, mm -hmm. and um, I do feel like it's a huge. Uh, you know, you're missing out on all these on all these incredible compounds. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, not every fruit or vegetable is going to be tolerated by every single oh, sure. person. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I mean, there's just so much good to be gained by eating the rainbow, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. as, as cliche as it sounds. Yeah. If you like that video, you need to check out this one here, and I'll see you there.